from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be about the Zodiac Killer. Now, we'll have to tackle this one a bit differently because it has never been definitively proven who the Zodiac actually was or possibly still is. So without further ado, let's get into it. It is not known exactly when the person who claimed to be the Zodiac Killer actually started killing. It is generally agreed, though, that the possible first murder took place in 1963. It is also widely accepted that Zodiac went silent in the early 70s, so, as we do, let's get into some history for that time. The 1960s were one of the most pivotal times of cultural awakening in recent history. Coming out of the conservative 50s, we began to have our new celebrity idols, such as Marilyn Monroe, Warren Beatty, Elizabeth Taylor, John F. Kennedy, Audrey Hepburn. The list is long. Before the dreaded paparazzi, we always saw the rich and the famous as glamorous and flawless. The first weather satellite was launched into orbit by the United States and Russia put the first human into space. The Berlin Wall was built to separate East and West Berlin, and the Peace Corps was created. The Cuban Missile Crisis had the entire world sitting on the edge of their seats as the United States and Russia very nearly launched nuclear bombs. John F. Kennedy was unfortunately assassinated, and Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, and he was sadly murdered just a few short years later. The first ever episode of Doctor Who was broadcasted by the BBC. The Beatles released their first single, Love Me Do, in the UK, and the comic book character, Spider-Man, premiered. There were civil rights protests and riots, the Vietnam War had begun, and the iconic show Star Trek first aired. Nixon, Woodstock, Sesame Street, and you get the idea. So, for the 70s, life was still good, but things were changing. NASA's Apollo 13 mission to the moon had to be deserted due to oxygen tank issues and an explosion. The first commercial flight from New York to London occurred. The movie Jaws was released and was a wild success. Bill Gates and Paul Allen created Microsoft. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak created Apple, and Saturday Night Live aired for the very first time, and disco. But the Beatles broke up, the United States invaded Cambodia as the Vietnam War raged on, but it did finally end in 1973. President Nixon was impeached after the Watergate scandal. The oil crisis happened after Arab nations stated that they would not export oil to countries that supported Israel. Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania had a cooling malfunction and caused the core and the number two reactor to melt, causing some radioactive gas to be released into the atmosphere. This caused serious public fears and since then, no new nuclear power plants have been built in the United States since, though there have been no known health defects as a result. And we also see a sharp increase in serial killers during this time, but more about that in an upcoming podcast. So, without knowing who the Zodiac Killer really was, there's no background to study. 
no family history to look at to see if there is any notable mental illness or childhood abuse and or neglect. There's no way of knowing if he was bullied relentlessly or suffered any abnormality as a child. So with that in mind, let's get into the timeline. On June 4th, 1963, engaged couple Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards decided to participate in their senior ditch day and spend the day lounging in the sun on the beach at Gaviota State Park near Santa Barbara, California. Someone approached them, forced them to tie the other up, but it is thought that the couple must have thought that they could run away. The person then shot them both dead, Robert 11 times and Linda 9. They then drugged the bodies to a nearby rundown shack that was used primarily by vagrants and laid Linda's body on top of Robert's face up. They then cut the top front of Linda's bathing suit open, exposing her breasts. The person then attempted to start a fire to burn the shed as well as the bodies inside, but the fire failed to take off. The next day, when the couple failed to return to their respective homes, Robert's father drove to the beach where he knew that they had gone. He looked and looked, and he finally discovered the couple in the shack. The police determined that the bullets used were Winchester Western Super X, which were the exact same kind as a verified Zodiac slaying a few years later. The future murders were quite similar as well, so it is believed that this was most likely the Zodiac Killer's first murder. On October 30th, 1966, three years later, new college student Sherry Bates left a note for her father simply stating, quote, Dad went to the RCC library. She then drove her VW Bug to the Riverside City College Library in Riverside, California. She never returned home. The following morning, her car was found abandoned in the library parking lot. The driver's side door left wide open. Next to the parking lot, situated between two houses, was Sherry's lifeless body. Her throat had been cut nearly to decapitation, and she had been stabbed numerous times. Next to her was a man's watch with a broken wristband, a military boot print, and in her hand, was some hairs and dried blood. Robbery didn't seem to be a motive as the contents of her purse were untouched. It was later determined that she had also not been sexually assaulted. A month later, the police, as well as the local newspaper, both received letters written on a typewriter. The title of the letters was The Confession, and the author, claiming to be the killer, wrote, quote, Miss Bates was stupid. She went to the slaughter like a lamb. I am not sick. I am insane." Then five months later, in April of 1967, the same newspaper, police department, and now Sherry Bates' father all received almost identical handwritten notes that said, quote, Bates had to die. There will be more. The letters were signed with the letter Z. On December 20th, 1968, David Faraday and his new girlfriend, Betty Lou Jensen, decided to go have their first official date. David assured her parents he would have her back by 11 p.m. They left the house in David's mom's car, visited a friend, ate dinner at a local restaurant, then decided to park on the local, quote, lover's lane, which was a gravel parking area along Lake Herman Road in Benicia, California. A witness saw the car parked there a little before 11 p.m., which would have been the curfew. So someone slowly pulled their car beside David's, parked, got out, and walked toward the couple. It is believed that the person began shooting at the car to get the two to run out of the car, and Betty was the first to emerge. But David also exited the car and the person shot him in the head. Betty tried to run, but she was shot in her back five times, falling to the ground 28 feet from the car. 
There was nothing stolen, no sexual assault. The killer then got back into his car and drove away. Not long after, another witness who lived close by was driving when they noticed what looked like two deceased people lying on the side of the road and drove on quickly to call the police. The police determined that a 22 caliber was used and the ammunition was again Winchester Western Super X. This murder is generally accepted as being committed by the Zodiac Killer. On July 4, 1969, 22-year-old Darlene Farron, married to Dean Farron, they had a young child together. She worked at a restaurant called Terry's, and she was adored not only by the staff, but by the customers. Everyone remarked about what a bright, bubbly, happy person she was. That night, Darlene picked up her friend Michael to talk and decided to park her car in the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, California. This was only four miles from Lake Herman, just for reference. Another car pulled into the parking lot around midnight, left, then returned only a few short minutes later. The driver of the car exited the vehicle, walked up to Darlene's car, shined a bright flashlight into the car and immediately began shooting. Darlene was shot repeatedly. Michael was shot in the leg, the shoulder, the jaw, and the chest. About 40 minutes later, a man called the Vallejo Police Department from a payphone nearly in the middle of town and said, quote, I want to report a murder, a double murder. If you go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye." Unquote. The dispatcher that received the call said that the man had a low, monotone voice. Though Darlene died on the way to the hospital, Michael actually survived the attack. He described the shooter as a white male, 5'8 to 5'9, in his late 20s or early 30s. He said he was stocky with a round face and brown hair. Michael stated that no words between he, Darlene, or the shooter were ever exchanged. They had simply thought it was a police officer and were in the process of getting their identification ready when he just began shooting into the car. On July 31, 1969, three California newspapers received nearly identical handwritten letters. Letter one was sent to the Vallejo Times Herald and it said, quote, Dear Editor, I am the killer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl last 4th of July. To prove this, I shall state some facts which only I and the police would know. Christmas, one, brand name of ammo Super X, two, 10 shots fired, three, boy was on back, feet to car, four, girl was lying on right side, feet to west. Fourth of July, one, girl was wearing patterned pants, two, boy was also shot in the knee, three, brand name of ammo was Western. Here is a cipher, or that is part of one. The other two parts have been mailed to the San Francisco Examiner and the San Francisco Chronicle. I want you to print this cipher on your front page by Friday afternoon, August 1st of 69. If you do not do this, I will go on a kill rampage Friday night that will last the whole weekend. I will cruise around and pick off all stray people or couples that are alone. Then move on to kill some more until I have killed over a dozen people." Unquote. The letter was signed with a crosshair symbol or a circle with a cross through it. I'm sure we are all familiar with the zodiac symbol. The two other letters said nearly the exact same thing verbatim. Looking at the letters, it is just a little odd because it's obvious that the author knows enough about punctuation, 
grammar and spelling to write a clear and concise letter, but there are also words like Christmas, for example, where he put an extra S on the end. There are times where he spells a word correctly more than once in one letter, then misspells it within the same letter. Is there something to that? I don't know. The ciphers he is referring to are the square shapes filled with columns and rows of random letters and symbols. We've all seen it. All three newspapers received different ciphers. Not long after, the newspapers relented and posted the cipher, and it was very quickly decoded by a couple, Donald and Betty Hardin, who lived in Salinas, California. They spent 20 hours studying and trying to decipher it, and here's what it said. Quote, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise and all of the people I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife." Unquote. Now there were some characters left at the end of the cipher that could not be decoded and it was decided that they were some other form of code that the couple was just not able to crack. Now it is interesting that the Zodiac Killer mentioned the book, uh, The Most Dangerous Game, which was written by Richard Connell and published in 1924. It's about a man who would capture shipwrecked sailors. He would outfit them with hunting clothes, a knife, and food, and give them a three-hour head start. He would then begin to hunt them like game. If they managed to evade him and survive for three days, he would let them go. Serial killer Robert Hansen hunted his victims in a similar fashion as this guy in the book. I have already released a podcast about Robert Hansen, so if you're interested, have a listen. On August 4th, 1969, a letter was received from the Zodiac Killer at the San Francisco Examiner again. The letter stated, quote, This is the Zodiac speaking. In answer to your asking for more details about the good times I have had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. On the 4th of July, I did not open the car door. The window was rolled down already. The boy was originally sitting in the front seat when I began firing. When I fired the first shot at his head, he leapt backwards at the same time, thus spoiling my aim. He ended up on the back seat, then the floor in the back, thrashing out very violently with his legs. That's how I shot him in the knee. I did not leave the scene of the killing with squealing tires and racing engine as described in the Vallejo paper. I drove away quite slowly so as to not draw attention to my car. The man who told police that my car was brown was a black man about 40 to 45, rather shabbily dressed. I was in this phone booth having some fun with the Vallejo cop when he went walking by. When I hung up the phone, the damn thing began to ring and that drew his attention to me and my car. Last Christmas in that episode, the police were wondering how I could shoot and hit my victims in the dark. They did not openly state this, but implied this by saying, it was a well-lit night and I could see silhouettes on the horizon. Bullshit. That area is surrounded by high hills and trees. What I did was tape a small pencil flashlight to the barrel of my gun. If you notice, in the center of the beam of light, if you aim it at a wall or a ceiling, you will see a black or dark spot in the center of that circle of light about three to six inches across. When taped to a gun barrel, the bullet will strike in the center of that black dot in the light. All I had to do was spray them as if it was a water hose. There was no need to use the gun sights. 
I was not happy to see that I did not get the front page, unquote. The letter was signed with the crosshair symbol, the zodiac symbol. On September 27, 1969, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, both college students, decided to have a picnic along the Lake Berryessa shore, north of Napa, California. A man in a dark costume with the crosshair symbol on his chest and wearing a dark hood over his head approached the couple. He was aiming a gun at them and he explained that he had just escaped from prison and needed their car and some money so that he could flee to Mexico. He then ordered the couple to tie each other's wrists with what appeared to be pre-cut lengths of wire. Then, without hesitation, the man immediately began stabbing Brian in the back a total of six times. Then he stabbed Cecilia ten times and she screamed and fought with everything she had. The assailant then went to Brian's car and with a pen drew the zodiac symbol on the door. Just below that he wrote, quote, Vallejo, 12 2068, September 2769 at 630 by knife. Unquote. The last entry on the door was the time when he thought he had murdered Brian and Cecilia. He then drove to a payphone at a car wash in Napa, called the police, and stated there had been a double murder. The murderer gave the police a description of the car, gave them directions to find the couple, and stated, quote, I am the one who did it. He then hung up. Brian and Cecilia were found and immediately taken to the hospital. Brian thankfully survived, but unfortunately, Cecilia died two days later. On October 11, 1969, Paul Stein was driving his cab in San Francisco. He was 28 years old, married, but also a student. He saw a man hailing for a cab, so he pulled over to pick him up. The man directed him toward Presidio... Heights, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which was a more affluent neighborhood. When Paul stopped at an intersection, the man shot him in the head. He then cut a piece of Paul's bloodied shirt to take with him as a trophy. The man was able to escape, but there were witnesses. So based on witness statements, the famous sketch of the man that we have all seen was drawn. It shows a white male with glasses a very stern looking face. He's described as 35 to 45 years old, although other witnesses said 30 to 35. He was approximately five foot eight to five foot nine, stocky build and brown hair. Fingerprints were also lifted from the taxi as well. So at first, this murder was not even considered to be connected to the Zodiac Killer. Police thought that it had been just an unfortunate robbery. On October 22, 1969, the Oakland Police Department got a phone call from a man claiming to be the Zodiac Killer. He demanded that he wanted attorney F. Lee Bailey to appear on a local TV talk show, but he said he would settle for a well-known local attorney named Melvin Belli. Later that day, Melvin appeared on the show hosted by Jim Dunbar. A man attempted to call and get through several times, but he was finally able to get through. Talk to us. Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, Sam. Please. I have headache. Right. How long have you had those headaches, Sam? It's been a long time. Since I killed a kid. What? Was it before December that you had the headaches? Yes. Were you in service? That you might have had the, an injury in service? Did you ever fall out of a tree or downstairs? Were you ever unconscious? I don't know. You don't remember. Does aspirin do you any good? No. Doesn't do any good. Sam, that yeah. stuff never did do any good either. When I had it. Sam, let me ask you a question. Did you, um, did you attempt to call this program one other time when Mr. Belli was with us? And you called. What? Did you try to call us one other time, about two, two or three weeks ago, when, when Mel Belli was with us? Yes. 
and you and uh, well and we wouldn't get through and we wouldn't get through the phones were tied up, was that it? Yeah. Sam, let, let me ask you this. There's some reason why you go to a particular doctor or a particular priest, and some reason why apparently you, you uh, wanted to talk to, to me or Lee. Is it that you feel that we have compassion for people who get in trouble? Or is it you feel that, uh, that we can do something for you? Or is it you feel that uh, we uh, have enough integrity that if we promise you something, that uh, we're going to stick to it? Well, let's find out what, what, why he wanted to talk to you. Why did you want to talk to Mr. Belli, Sam? I don't want to be hurt. One of the Zodiac survivors, as well as police dispatchers who had actually heard Zodiac's real voice, claimed this man was not the actual Zodiac, or it certainly didn't sound like him. A letter was received at the San Francisco Chronicle on November 8, 1969, almost a month after the cab shooting. The front of the envelope stated, quote, please rush to editor. The letter said, Quote, this is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over by Washington and Maple Street last night. To prove this, here is a blood-stained piece of his shirt. I am the same man who did in the people in the North Bay area. The San Francisco police could have caught me last night if they had searched the park properly instead of holding road races with their motorcycles, seeing who could make the most noise. The cab drivers should have just parked their cars and sat there quietly waiting for me to come out of cover. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tire and then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out." Unquote. The letter was signed with the zodiac symbol. The next day, the Chronicle received yet another letter from the Zodiac, and it said, quote, This is the Zodiac speaking. I thought you would need a good laugh before you hear the bad news. You won't get the news for a hole yet. P.S. Could you print this new cipher on your front page? I get awfully lonely when I'm ignored. So lonely I could do my thing. Unquote. As you see, some of the language sounds like it's starting to get a little disjointed, so I am reading this verbatim the way that he wrote it. Um, written below that letter were the letters D-E-S, then July, August, September, October equals 7. The letter was accompanied by a yellow greeting card that had a picture of a fountain pen that was dripping blood out of the tip that said, quote, sorry I haven't written, but I just washed my pen. Then immediately, a seven-page letter from the Zodiac Killer was received at the Chronicle. Here's what it said, quote, this is the Zodiac speaking. Up to the end of October, I have killed seven people. I have grown rather angry with the police for their telling lies about me. So I shall change the way the collecting of slaves. I shall no longer announce to anyone. When I commit my murders, they shall look like routine robberies, killings of anger, plus a few fake accidents, etc. The police shall never catch me because I have been too clever for them. One, I look like the description passed out only when I do my thing. The rest of the time I look entirely different. I shall not tell you what my disguise consists of when I kill. 2. As of yet, I have left no fingerprints behind me, contrary to what the police say. In my killings, I wear transparent fingertip guards. All it is, is two coats of airplane cement coated on my fingertips. Quite unnoticeable and very effective. 3. My killing tools have been boughten through the mail, order outfits before the ban went into effect, except one, and it was bought out of the state. So as you can see, the police don't have much to work on. If you wonder why I was wiping the cab down, I was leaving fake clues for the police to run all over town with, as one might say. I gave the cops some busy work to do to keep them happy. I enjoy needling the blue pigs. Hey, blue pig, I was in the park. 
You were using fire trucks to mask the sound of your cruising prowl cars. The dogs never came within two blocks of me, and they were to the west, and there was only two groups of parking about 10 minutes apart. Then the motorcycles went by about 150 feet away, going from south to northwest. P.S. Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. I was walking down the hill to the park when this cop car pulled up, and one of them called me over and asked if I saw anyone acting suspicious or strange in the last five to ten minutes, and I said yes. There was this man who was running, running by, waving a gun, and the cops peeled rubber and went around the corner as I directed them. I disappeared into the park a block and a half away, never to be seen again. Hey pig, doesn't it rile you up to have your nose rubbed in your boo-boos? If you cops think I'm going to take on a bus the way I stated I was, you deserve to have holes in your heads." Unquote. Uh, he then describes how he plans on making a bomb, which I will not recite here for obvious reasons, but then he goes on to say, quote, the death machine is already made. I would have sent you pictures, but you would be nasty enough to trace them back to a developer and then to me, so I shall describe my masterpiece to you. The nice part of it is that all the parts can be bought on the open market with no questions asked. And then more bomb descriptions with no need to discuss. Bus goes bang. Car passes by okay. The system checks out from one end to the other in my tests. What you do not know is whether the death machine is at the site or whether it is being stored in my basement for future use. I think you do not have the manpower to stop this one by continually searching the roadsides looking for this thing. And it won't do to reroute or reschedule the buses because the bomb can be adapted to new conditions. Have fun! By the way, it could be rather messy if you try to bluff me. P.S. Be sure to print the part I marked out on page 3 or I shall do my thing. To prove that I am the Zodiac, ask the Vallejo cop about my electric gun site which I use to start my collecting of slaves." Unquote. So again, looking at this letter, it is obvious that the Zodiac killer was a reasonably educated man. His grammar, his punctuation, his spelling are excellent through most of his writings. So then it becomes painfully obvious that he was intentionally misspelling words. And I have to wonder if that's not also some form of code. Not the same as his ciphers, but still maybe something else. But I assume since I thought this up, someone else must have. So around Christmas in 1969, the well-known attorney who had been on the talk show when the supposed Zodiac called and spoke to him, received a letter from the Zodiac Killer. It said, quote, Dear Melvin, this is the Zodiac speaking. I wish you a happy Christmas. The one thing I ask of you is this, please help me. I cannot reach out for help because of this thing in me won't let me. I am finding it extremely difficult to hold it in check. I am afraid I will lose control again and take my ninth and possibly tenth victim. Please help me. I am drowning. At the moment, the children are safe from the bomb because it is so massive to dig in, and the trigger mechanism requires much work to get it adjusted just right. But if I hold back too long, then number nine, I will lose all control of myself and set the bomb up. Please help me. I cannot remain in control much longer." Unquote. Signed with the Zodiac Killer symbol. On March 22, 1970, 22-year-old Kathleen Johns decided she wanted to go pay a visit to her sick mother in Petaluma, California. She packed for herself, who was seven months pregnant at the time, and her tiny daughter. She said goodbye to her boyfriend and hit the road, leaving Modesto. As she was driving, another car drove up beside her and signaled that she needed to pull over and, thinking there must be something wrong with her car, she did. The man pulled over with her, 
got out of his vehicle and told her that one of her back wheels was loose and that he would fix it for her. So she was relieved and she allowed the stranger to help only. Instead of tightening the lug nuts, he loosened them and as she attempted to drive away, the wheel fell off. She stopped again. The stranger offered to drive her to the nearest gas station and again, grateful for the help, she got her daughter and they got into the man's car. Once in the car, the man's whole demeanor changed. Kathleen later stated he began to make veiled threats to hurt her and her daughter. She said he drove past several gas stations and he kept driving back and forth on back roads for about an hour and a half. If she asked him why he wasn't stopping, he would just quickly change the subject. So finally, when he stopped at an intersection, she made the quick decision to grab her child and jump from the vehicle. She hid with her daughter in a field as the driver looked for her, shouting he wouldn't hurt her, but he eventually gave up and he left. So Kathleen flagged down a car and had them take her and her daughter to the nearest police station. She identified the man in the Zodiac sketch as the man who she felt had tried to abduct her and her child. Then later, when her car was found, it had been gutted and set on fire. In April of 1970, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Chronicle really became his favorite, they received another letter from the Zodiac Killer, and it read, quote, This is the Zodiac speaking. By the way, have you cracked the last cipher I sent you? My name is, and then there was 13 letters and symbols. I am mildly curious as to how much money you have on my head right now. I hope you do not think that I was the one who wiped out that blue meanie with a bomb at the cop station, even though I talked about killing school children with one. It just wouldn't do to move in on someone else's territory, but there is more glory in killing a cop than a kid because a cop can shoot back. I have killed 10 people to date. It would have been a lot more, except that my bus bomb was a dud. I was swamped out by the rain we had a while back. The new bomb is set up like this. And then he has a diagram of his bomb with notes on the page about the sun position, bus location, and so on. Again, not sharing that. P.S. I hope you have fun trying to figure out who I killed. Unquote. The letter was signed with the Zodiac's symbol, then the equal sign 10, SFPD equals zero. So this means that the Zodiac has killed 10, San Francisco Police Department, zero. Eight days later, a greeting card was received at the Chronicle. It was a picture of what looked like one hillbilly riding a donkey and another hillbilly riding a dragon. The card says, sorry to hear your ass is a dragon. He then wrote, quote, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast, unquote, signed with his symbol. Inside the card, he wrote, quote, if you don't want me to have this blast, you must do two things. Tell everyone about the bus bomb with all the details. I would like to see some nice Zodiac buttons wandering about town. Everyone else has these buttons like the peace symbol, black power, Melvin eats blubber, etc. Well, it would cheer me up considerably if I saw a lot of people wearing my button. Please no nasty ones like Melvin's. Thank you. Unquote. Signed with his symbol. The Zodiac sent yet another letter to the Chronicle in late June, and it said, quote, This is the Zodiac speaking. I have become very upset with the people of San Fran Bay area. They have not complied with my wishes for them to wear some nice Zodiac symbol buttons. I promised to punish them if they did not comply by annihilating a full school bus. But now school is out for the summer, so I punished them in another way. I shot a man sitting in a parked car with a 38. He then drew his symbol equals 12, SFPD equals zero. The map coupled with this code will tell you where the bomb is set. 
you have until next fall to dig it up, unquote. It was followed by two lines of symbols and letters that no one's been able to decode yet. But included with the letter was a map of San Francisco and on the map he had drawn his symbol over Mount Diablo. So a month later, another letter arrives that said, quote, this is the Zodiac speaking. I am rather unhappy because you people will not wear some nice Zodiac symbol buttons. So now I have a little list, starting with the woman and her baby that I gave a rather interesting ride for a couple of hours one evening, a few months back that ended in my burning her car where I found them. It was signed with his symbol. Two days later, another letter arrived at the Chronicle. Now for reference, this letter is verbally disjointed. I am reading it exactly as he wrote it. He starts a sentence with one thought and he ends it with another. He repeats the same sentence he wrote just prior. It is difficult to understand and there are some words that are actually not words. So I just wanted to preface with that. So here we go. Quote, this is the Zodiac speaking. Being that you will not wear some nice buttons, how about wearing some nasty buttons or any type of buttons? with my symbol that you can think up. If you do not wear any type of buttons, I shall, on top of everything else, torture all 13 of my slaves that I have waiting for me in paradise. Some I shall tie over ant hills and watch them scream and twitch and squirm. Others shall have pine splinters driven under their nails and then burned. Others shall be placed in cages and fed salt beef until they are gorged. Then I shall listen to their pleas for water and I shall laugh at them. Others will hang by their thumbs and burn in the sun. Then I will rub them down with deep heat to warm them up. Others I shall skin them alive and let them run around screaming. And all billiard players I shall have them play in a darkened dungeon cell with crooked cues and twisted shoes. Yes, I shall have great fun inflicting the most delicious of pain to my slaves. SFPD zero, Zodiac 13. As someday it may happen that a victim must be found, I've got a little list. I've got a little list of society offenders who might well be underground, who would never be missed. They would never be missed. There is the pestilential nuisances who write for autographs, all people who have flabby hands and irritating laughs, all children who are up in dates and implore you with M. Platt. All people who are shaking hands, shaking hands like that. And all third persons who, with unspoiling, take those who insist. They'd none of them be missed. They'd none of them be missed. There's a banjo serenader and the others of his race and the piano organist. I got him on the list. All people who eat peppermint and foam fit in your face, they would never be missed. They would never be missed. And the idiot who phrases with enthusiastic tone of centuries, but this in every country but his own. And the lady from the provinces who dress like a guy who doesn't cry. And the singularly abnormality, the girl who never kissed. I don't think she would be missed. I'm sure she wouldn't be missed. And that nice empress that is rather rife, the judicial humorist. I've got him on the list. All funny fellows, comic men and clowns of private life. They'd none of them be missed. And uncompromising kinds such as whatchamacallit, thingamabob, and the like. Wise, well, never mind. And tut, 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 tut. And watch his name. And you know who, but the task of filling up the blanks, I rather leave up to you. But it really doesn't matter whom you place upon the list, for none of them be missed. None of them be missed. P.S. The Mount Diablo Code concerns radians and the number of inches along the radians. Unquote. Absorb that. That is how he wrote it. So on September 6th, 1970, 25-year-old Donna Lass, 
who had recently moved from San Francisco to Lake Tahoe, was working as a nurse at the Sahara Hotel and Casino. Her last entry in her work log was at 1.50 a.m. The next day, her car was found abandoned near her apartment. Now, this disappearance is generally attributed to the Zodiac Killer as he sent a postcard to the Chronicle the next year speaking of another victim that sounded like her. A month later, the Chronicle received a postcard that said, quote, Dear Editor, you'll have me, but I've got to tell you, the pace isn't any slower. In fact, it's just one big 13th. Some of them thought it was horrible. There are reports city police pig cops are closing in on me, but I'm crackproof. What is the price tag now? Unquote. This postcard was not handwritten. It was cut and pasted together with various word cutouts from newspapers and magazines. So on and on, the Zodiac sent letters to the Chronicle saying that he had taken his 14th victim. He also sent a letter to the Los Angeles Times in early 1971, admitting to killing Sherry Bates, who, if you remember, was found dead near the library parking lot back in 66. Zodiac then went quiet for about three years, or at least there was no correspondence or murders that could be linked to him. Then, in early 1974, the letters and postcards started arriving at the Chronicle again. He began boasting of having 37 victims now. The Zodiac Killer sent a total of four ciphers, and to this day, only the one has been decoded that was decoded by the couple. And then, nothing. Poof, he vanished. He dropped off the grid completely. There have been many fingers pointed at many different men, and the best fit was a man named Arthur Lee Allen. He had been questioned on several occasions, uh, closely resembled the sketch, but in 2010 he was finally eliminated. The authorities are currently looking at pulling DNA from the back of the stamps he placed on his correspondence with the media and seeing if they can't catch him in the same manner that they caught the Golden State Killer with genealogy DNA records. So let's get an idea of what the experts who studied this case have said. Criminal profiler Sharon Hagen, who worked on the Zodiac case, said in an interview that, quote, offenders can't help but give us clues about who they are, where they've been, what their prior relationships look like, what their future relationships look like. So those kinds of things can give us very important clues in how to search for him and how he's likely to behave when we encounter him. She stated that he had no need to confide in anyone, that he was a loner. He committed his crimes on weekends and holidays, which shows that he had a Monday through Friday job and he was very busy. He must have lived a structured life during the week, but then on weekends he seemed to be adrift and drove around a lot, fantasizing about what he wanted to do. The times between the crimes became less and less, so his confidence level increased rapidly then just stops and shifts his focus into communicating with the media completely. You see, criminals who hunt, they don't spend time talking. Analyzing his communications, he came to see himself as a citizen as time went on. His last communication, he actually signed it a citizen. So what was the emotional payoff? to establish himself as an important news person in a bizarre marketing ploy. He wanted to be famous and important in San Francisco. He could very well have decided to drop his criminal lifestyle to settle down and there is a small chance he might still be alive today. So the head of Question Documents CI and I, Sherwood Morrill, stated that the Zodiac was not unintelligent by any means. His paragraphing and punctuation are very good. He deliberately misspelled words 
to make the authorities believe he was illiterate. Gerald McManaman, a forensic linguistic expert, said, quote, I was provided the Zodiac writings. There is a clear attempt at disguising the language of those letters, in particular with respect to spelling and misspelling. Gerald said that the Zodiac alternated words like about, do, some, those, and out from being spelled correctly or incorrectly. He alternated that. It would be very unlikely for someone with the literary skill that the Zodiac obviously had to misspell these words unintentionally. So as far as a psychological profile goes, the Zodiac is labeled a hedonistic, psychopathic thrill killer. So let's break that down. Hedonistic means he can abstain from killing for long periods of time, and he was very meticulous and very organized in his planning and execution. A psychopath as most of us already know, are in constant need of stimulation. They're pathological liars. They have no sense of guilt or empathy and so on. Uh, a thrill killer is someone who doesn't commit murder due to any mental defect or for sexual fulfillment, but rather just for the thrill of killing someone. They compared uh, the Zodiac killer's profile type with Israel Keys, which was another serial killer that, of course, will be in an upcoming podcast. So, Dr. Lawrence Friedman, chairman of the Institute of Social and Behavioral Pathology at the University of Chicago, stated that the Zodiac Killer led a terror-dominated life, insisting on his power due to feeling powerless that Zodiac's behavior indicated that he was most likely insane and suicidal. His suicide, if committed, would have been a final expression of what his homicides meant to him. Another psychological assessment by William F. Baker stated that the Zodiac was, quote, impotent, shrewd, and paranoid, in which, based on 35 years of experience in handwriting analysis, Baker portrayed the Zodiac as unquestionably paranoid and possibly schizophrenic. Now, if we go back to one of his last correspondences that I read to you guys and how disjointed and how carry on, quote unquote, these sentences were, then you can kind of see the schizophrenic tendency there. Um, so, whoever the Zodiac was or is, this case still holds our curiosity because it has, as of this recording, never been solved. There have been so many suspects that have had potential. And I'm going to actually do a part two to this case, which will be released in a few days and with a special guest so that we can discuss the possible suspects that have come to light. I hope you enjoy that. Please let me know if you do. So what do you think? You can leave me comments on my Instagram page at, at serial underscore killing and let me know. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day. Music by Kevin MacLeod on Incompetech.com.